In this video we are going to talk about multi-qubit systems and the most interesting thing they can produce, entanglement. This spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called it, means that in some cases parts of a larger quantum system, like a group of particles, cannot be described independently from the rest, not even if they are separated by a large distance or otherwise isolated from each other. The reason for this inseparability is that entanglement gives a multiparticle system more degrees of freedom than what the sum of its parts could have, and the extra degrees manifest as correlations between otherwise random events. Earlier we have talked about a magic book, a book full of strange symbols describing magical objects. As we found out, these objects are enchanted coins that a wizard invented to cheat at heads or tails. The next chapter of the book is about mind-boggling interactions of these coins, and the book uses even more mysterious symbols to describe them. First, the book introduces a new notation. If the enchanted coins are independent from each other, then you can describe all of them with the bar chart we are now familiar with. However, if you want to represent two coins together, you can do that by scaling down the width and copying the chart of the second coin under each bar of the first chart. Similarly, if there is a third coin, you can add that to the graph by copying it under each section of the previous chart. But why does the book insist on doing this? Although it looks nice, the graph becomes more and more complicated with each step. Well, one reason is because you can read the probabilities of certain events from the resulting graph. Remember, the rows correspond to individual coins, while the columns show certain outcomes. For example, three black coins stacked on top of each other represent all three coins coming up as cat zero. Or, a white bar sandwiched between two black bars mean the first and third coin coming up as cat zero, but the second one coming up as cat one. The relative width of these individual sections gives you the probability. If the width of one section is 10% of the entire graph's width, then the probability of this event occurring is 10%. If it's half the width of the entire graph, then the probability is 50%. The visualization of the phase is a bit more complicated now, it's shared between coins. This means that if more than one bar has non-zero phase in one section, then we can add them up by adding up their heights. However, the old rules still apply. Only one line representing the phase can appear over one bar. For the sake of clarity, we recommend that you add up all the phases and that you represent them in the lowermost row. In a sense, a collection of coins behaves like a loaded die, at least one of those strange role-playing ones that have an unusual number of sides, 2 to the power of n faces to be exact where n is the number of coins, and instead of numbers, each face is marked with the possible outcome of flipping all the coins. Rolling the die gives you one of the outcomes probabilistically, and the die being loaded means that we can change the probability of any and all outcomes individually. We also have to keep in mind that a phase is also associated with each and every outcome, and that only the relative phase is measurable. Being able to freely change the load and alter the chances means that we can create some extreme situations. For example, we could distort the probabilities to the point where some outcomes are impossible, or one particular outcome has a 100% chance. The only thing we are constrained by is that the sum of all probabilities must be 100%. The reason for this is that one and only one side of the die must point up the moment it comes to rest. Being able to arbitrarily change the load is interesting, because some configurations of the load yield a result that's impossible to create using independent coins. For example, let's say that we have two coins loaded in a way that two cat zeros or two cat ones coming up have equal probability, but the other two possibilities have a zero chance. This would mean that whichever side comes up during the first coin flip, the side that comes up during the second coin flip, must be exactly the same. But these are coins we can separate, or at least separate physically. On the other hand, we cannot talk about them as separate objects mathematically, and these graphs clearly indicate that. Remember, we constructed the graph of two independent qubit coins by copying the state of the second one under each bar of the first one. But in this case, there is no bar chart that could represent a separate coin. It should have one color under one side, and another color under the other side, and that's impossible. This is indeed one of the reasons the magic book insists on using these complicated graphs to describe multiple qubit coins. There is no simpler way to represent them. So how can we create such coin pairs? One way is through a trick that the wizard invented. The easiest way to explain it is through the graphs. What it does is it changes the color of all bars representing the second coin if they are under a white bar. You can imagine this as a coin-operated box. It can do two different things with the second coin, depending on how you insert the first coin. In this particular case, 
If you insert the first control coin with its cat one side up, then it swaps the probability amplitudes associated with each coin face on the second target coin. However, if you insert the control coin with its cat zero side up, nothing happens to the target coin. But let's not forget that a qubit coin can be in a superposition of both sides, and therefore a box that can be controlled by a qubit coin can be in a superposition of doing two different things at once. The magic book hints that this is one of the main reasons why qubit coins became famous. In theory, you can link boxes like this together, each controlled by a coin that a previous one targeted, and the resulting automaton can perform several different calculations simultaneously. Although a multitasking machine is nice, the reason why wizards are so obsessed with building an automaton like this is because of how fast its capacity is growing. Each added control coin doubles the number of operations it can do in superposition. This means that with only 100 odd control qubit coins, the computational capacity vastly exceeds anything conventional automatons are capable of, at least in theory. But let's get back to our coin pairs. After all, the first step toward creating a machine like this is to understand how its simplest building blocks work. One famous set of states are the so-called Bell states. There are four of them, and we can prepare them by inserting the right control and target coins into our black boxes. The really interesting thing about them, and the reason why we talk about Bell states together, is because we can distinguish these four states using the right measurements. Another interesting thing about them is they are maximally untangled. The word entangled means that we can no longer describe a pair like this mathematically as independent objects. In other words, if we combine two coins magically, then they can be more than just the sum of their parts. But what does this extra connection mean? Well, individually, both qubit coins look like a normal spinning coin. We could not tell them apart from any other spinning coin, at least not without performing some sophisticated tricks with them. They also behave in familiar ways if we catch them. Individually, they have a 50-50% chance of showing either their cat1 or cat0 side. But the real magic lies in how they behave in relation to each other. Some coin pairs always come up with the same side on top, while others show their opposite sides. Remember, the columns in the graph indicate particular outcomes of a measurement. This means that in these two cases, if we catch one coin and its cat1 side comes up, the other coin flip has to have the exact same result no matter how far it is. In the other two cases, if we flip the first coin, whatever we get as a result, we can be sure that in the second coin toss, the other side will come up. Theoretically, we could continue this and untangle more and more qubit coins. While this might be necessary for more advanced applications and magic tricks, right here, an untangled pair will be enough for us to examine their strange behavior. The magic book dedicates many pages to the useful tricks that can be performed with these untangled coins, and even more to the arguments about this phenomenon and how wizards were confused by it. This is where the story about mages and coins ends. Remember, the only reason we are talking about magic is to let go of our preconceptions and to avoid shoehorning quantum mechanics into familiar but misleading classical pigeonholes. Now let's take a closer look at how much of this story is actually true. First, the part about how some collections of qubits cannot be described as individual objects is realistic. It's also true that the only way to mathematically describe multiple entangled qubits is by handling them as a single object. Earlier we have talked about how we can describe an arbitrary quantum bit by assigning a phase and the probability to both its cat0 and cat1 states. Now we have to realize that this is only true for pure and separable quantum bits. But not every qubit is separable. To properly describe a multi-qubit system, we need to first identify all the possible outcomes a measurement could have and assign a probability amplitude to each and every one of them. In case of quantum bits, these possible outcomes mean every combination of bit values. For example, a 2-qubit system can be in cat00, cat01, cat10, and cat11 states. The probability and the phase will be associated with these distinct outcomes and not with individual qubits. In some cases, of course, these qubits are separable. As we mentioned earlier, we can construct the graph of a multi-qubit system by copying the chart of one qubit under each section of the others. If we can reverse this process, then the qubits are separable, if we cannot, then they are not separable. But separability is not just a concept that applies to individual qubits. It can apply to multi-qubit systems as well. For example, the following 4-qubit state separates into two 2-qubit two bell states. By the way, bell states are absolutely real. 
The story about coin-operated boxes is made up of course, but it illustrates a logic gate called a control knot, or C knot for short. The function of a C knot gate is to negate the value of a so-called target bit if and only if the value of a control bit is 1. This operation plays a crucial role in producing entanglement. The maximally entangled states got their name from John Stuart Ball, and they really are correlated. Measured individually, the outcome is random, but these seemingly random outcomes are not independent from one another. Some Bell states always produce the exact same result, regardless whether it's cat0 or cat1, while others produce complementary results. For example, if we measure the spin of two entangled particles in a perfectly correlated Bell state, then we could get two possible outcomes. Either both of them are pointing up, or both of them are pointing down. We cannot tell which possibility will be the outcome of the measurement, but if we measure just one of them, we can predict the outcome of the other measurement with absolute certainty. This happens regardless of how far they are from each other, but since the outcome is random, you cannot use this to send faster than light signals, regardless of how often science fiction gets this wrong. However, there are a lot of things you can do with these entangled pairs. Almost all important quantum algorithms rely on these states. They are an integral part of superdense coding, a method of sending two bits of information at the cost of sending a single signal, quantum teleportation, and quantum parallelism, a method in which a quantum computer is capable of performing several calculations in superposition. So this concludes our introduction to multiple quantum bits and entanglement. The main point is that whenever you are working with more than one qubit, you have to handle them as a single object. You still assign probability amplitudes to certain states, and these states are still outcomes of measurements, but now you perform these measurements on all of the qubits. As per usual, you can derive the probability of each outcome and the phase from the probability amplitudes. Thanks for watching, and see you at the next video.